Today's video is brought to you by the legends over at HelloFresh who are transforming you into a foodie without you ever having to leave your own home. Brilliant. Honestly, who's got the time to cook a full meal from scratch anymore after a long day of work? Nobody wants to spend hours preparing a meal. Unfortunately, their options can be tricky, expensive, or just plain unhealthy. Take away kebabs, anybody. One fun fact from a Zag dining survey, HelloFresh is up to 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant. So yes, HelloFresh is the perfect solution that checks every box. It's going to help you try something that's fresh and adventurous, it's affordable, it's convenient, and also, extra bonus, it's environmentally conscious. Also, you do it all from the comfort of your own home. I feel like that's the big one. Yes, with HelloFresh, you get specially designed five-star meals that are going to break you out of your recipe rut. They work with local farmers to offer more than 30 dinner recipes to choose from every week, all of which are delicious. Locally sourced meals that help you skip the meal prep and put dinner on the table quickly. As little as 20 minutes if you're using one of their quick and easy 20-minute recipes. It's right there in the title, isn't it? Right now, HelloFresh is dishing out some sweet seasonal summer savings from their Taste of Summer series. They've got Old Bay Shrimp and Sausage Boil, Grilled Leek Lettuce, Wraps, Cheese Stuffed Burgers, oh, that sounds good, Pesto Aioli, oh, oh, I'm so hungry. All of that sounds excellent, it does, but of course, if you like variety and never locked into any option, you can change your preferences as you wish. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code BRAINFOOD16 to get up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. An excellent deal from our friends at HelloFresh and now today's video. 16 free meals, huh? That's a good one. When Boris Yeltsin resigned as president of the Russian Federation, it was expected but sudden. He resigned so his Prime Minister, Vladimir Putin, could become president on January the 1st, 2000, the start of the new millennium. Since then, Putin has been the most powerful man in Russia and one of the most powerful men in the world. Today, that power has been felt worldwide as the war rages in Ukraine, contributing to gas price hikes, food insecurity in many countries, and not exactly helping the soaring inflation felt around the world. It may surprise many to learn that this man, who was only the Russian Federation's second president is not a career politician and had his position more or less thrust upon him precisely because of this. So how did Vladimir Putin come to power in the first place and how has he managed to maintain his position as the leader of Russia for quite so long? Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin was born on October 7, 1952, in Leningrad. Vladimir's father, also called Vladimir, was a factory worker and a former soldier who fought in the siege of Leningrad. His mother Maria gave birth to two sons who died before Vladimir was born. At first, the family lived in a communal apartment that was barely big enough for them, let alone the other two families they had to share it with. As you might have deduced from all of this, Putin grew up in poverty and would get into fights around his apartment building, a habit that would land him in trouble as an adult and even risk jeopardizing his career at points. This habit would also lead him to channel that energy into Sambo, a Russian martial art that combines catch-as-catch-can wrestling with judo. Putin would later practice judo proper, and it is one of the things he is known for on the world stage. As for education, Vladimir did not get good grades at first, but the chance to join a sports club to learn martial arts inspired him to improve his mind as well, along with another motivation to improve his marks, which we'll get into shortly. He also learned German in school, which would likewise greatly influence his trajectory later. What may come as a surprise, given where he's ended up, is that Putin was politics-averse as a youth. For example, he declined to join the youth wing of the Communist Party, even as he was pressured to do so by teachers and fellow students. However, Putin would eventually relent and find that he was a natural leader. One thing that he was far more interested in, even as a child, however, was spycraft. As a teenager, he dreamed of joining the KGB, inspired by approved literature and film about Soviet spies during World War II. There circulates, whether fully accurate or not, a famous story where in 1968, a teenage Putin walked into the KGB headquarters in Leningrad and asked a guard what he needed to study in order to get into the KGB. The guard told him he should study law. Allegedly emboldened by the response, Putin started to put more energy into school, hoping to enter Leningrad State University for law and ultimately achieved this goal. However, he was warned by his coaches and friends early on that he would not enjoy the more realistic life of a KGB officer compared to the one he saw in films. Still, Putin persisted, and his studies in university instilled in him a great respect for law and order. He ultimately interned for the city's transport ministry and its criminal division until he wound up getting recruited to the KGB 
1975. In 1976, Putin became a first lieutenant, working for the KGB's counterintelligence department, the Second Chief Directorate. Here, he learned how to recruit informants and collaborators in the war with the Soviet Union's internal enemies. As much talk of deep states in modern conspiracy theories, but the KGB was truly a state within a state. It monitored everything to ensure law and order within and without the Soviet Union, and Putin learned a lot from his time working for them. The without part is something Putin would become more familiar with, as after six months he was transferred to the first chief directorate, which handled intelligence outside of the borders of the Soviet Union. That said, while you might envision Hollywood spy-type scenarios where his daily life, in fact, according to journalist and biographer Masha Genson, quote, Putin and his colleagues were reduced mainly to collecting press clippings, thus contributing to the mountains of useless information produced by the KGB. Nevertheless, his employment in the KGB brought out a side of Putin that would become central to his rise to power. He worked. He worked hard, meticulously, and he kept his head down. He had ambitions, no doubt, but they don't appear to have been initially to rule the country or party, but rather to advance in the KGB. For now, he monitored and shadowed foreigners in Leningrad until 1985, when he would be sent to the Red Banner Institute for training in foreign intelligence. This was the real spy school where he fulfilled his childhood dream. However, his fondness for fighting continued as an adult, with the consequence that his conduct there resulted in him being unable to get into the secret service. Instead, he was assigned to Dresden in East Germany because of his knowledge of German. There he worked with the KGB and the Stasi, East Germany's secret police, during the last half decade of the Eastern Bloc. There he immersed himself in German culture and by all accounts performed his duties with distinction. The unraveling of Eastern Germany, which was most dramatically captured in the fall of the Berlin Wall, impacted Putin deeply. He saw the Soviet Union's reach in the area crumble before his eyes and Moscow, unable to even relay simple orders to the KGB amidst the chaos. In 1989, he returned home to Russia. Due to Gorbachev's social and economic reforms like Glasnost and Perestroika, the Soviet Union's days were visibly at an end at home as well. Putin didn't know what the future held for him, either as a Russian or as a KGB officer. This was not unique to him, as for most Russians, the future was uncertain. A way of life was coming to an end, and there was a lot of chaos in building a new one. While still working for the KGB, he was assigned the position of assistant to the rector at Leningrad State University. This was a semi-official KGB post used to spy on foreign students. And now into the picture, Anatoly Sobchak, a professor of law at the university and would-be democratic reformer. Sobchak recruited Putin in May of 1990 for his elections to the city council. In this, Putin disclosed to Sobchak that he was an active KGB agent, but Sobchak did not mind. He ran for city council and then chairman of the city council. He wished to establish free elections for the post of mayor as part of his platform of democratic reforms. The hope was that a referendum could be held in which he would be elected mayor and the city would be renamed its original name, St. Petersburg. And that's exactly what happened in 1991. In all of this, Sobchak trusted Putin as a reliable worker and soon he would reward him. Also during this period, Putin tried to quit the KGB twice, as his active status with the agency attracted too much scrutiny. The first time he tried to quit was in the beginning of his tenure with Sobchak. He tried again during a failed coup in 1991. However, the KGB were only too happy to have him in Sobchak's midst. They even tried to lean on Putin to supply them with a document which would allow them to manipulate Sobchak, which Putin refused to provide, not wanting to violate Sobchak's trust. His resignation was ultimately accepted, and he was officially out of the agency that had served for most of his life. Now, going back to Sobchak, his time as mayor did not go well. The democratic reformer became known as anti-democratic in his dealings with the city council. He often tried to shut them out of important decisions, kneecap his rivals and any challenges to his mayorship, and he was accused of numerous under-the-table dealings. Putin also was not immune from this seemingly shady behavior. In fact, the first rumor that Putin was using a government position to stash away quite a lot of money for his own personal gain came around this time in his then position as head of the Committee for External Relations at the Mayor's Office in St. Petersburg. Specifically, when he allegedly helped broker a $93 million deal to acquire various food supplies for the city. In a nutshell, various companies were granted permits that would allow them to supply huge amounts of materials to foreign entities, and in exchange, they'd be given an equivalent value back in foodstuffs to then be used within the famished city. 
The thing was, as far as anyone could tell, while the companies did send out the materials, no foodstuffs came back in return. The matter was ultimately investigated by one Marina Salyi at the behest of the city council, with Salyi in turn claiming Putin's signature could be found authorizing the deals. She states, The raw materials were shipped abroad, but the food didn't materialize. There's 100% proof that in this, Putin was to blame. As a result, in 1992, when there was no food at all, the city was left with nothing. The evidence I have is as solid as it gets. Putin, well, his committee, made bartering contracts to get food for the city. He issued licenses, and commodities, wood, metal, cotton, heating oil, and oil flew out of the country. That said, while she states Putin was to blame, and at least according to her, she had definitive proof, she did not find any evidence that Putin had received anything in return for the apparently botched deals. As for Putin, he claimed that the companies that had been given the export permits in the deal were to blame for the foodstuffs not coming back as they were supposed to have, implying Putin had no knowledge the deals wouldn't be completed as originally brokered when he issued the licenses. The city council would move forward with further investigation, but ultimately Mayor Sobjak put a stop to it and the matter was dropped. While you're reading many outlets reporting this story that Salyi would die of so-called natural causes mere weeks after she made these accusations and the investigation was killed, in truth, she would go on to help found the Free Democratic Party of Russia and more or less continually rail against Putin to anyone in the media and the public who would listen, until eventually giving up in 2000 after the election and moving to the countryside. There she lived until her death at the age of 77 in 2012. Although she still did give a handful of interviews during that span, still unabashedly anti-Putin. In any event, going back to his rise to power, Putin was linked to the federal government of the new Russia under Boris Yeltsin's administration. Sobchak and Yeltsin were friends and shared a lot of the same economic ideals that made 1990s Russia a tumultuous place. Boris Yeltsin's shock therapy was an attempt to shock Russia's economy into rapid capitalism. In the end, it also encouraged a lot of corruption and rising crime. And speaking of seediness, Sobchak's regime in St. Petersburg attempted to change the city into a Russian Las Vegas. To help him in his various ventures, Sobchak gave Putin the position of deputy mayor. This is when we can ostensibly say Putin entered politics. Putin was supposedly surprised at the promotion, but he accepted the new duties. He used his knowledge of the German culture and language to travel to Germany to foster connections for the mayor there. Putin claimed these visits changed him as he got to see West Germany for the first time and how it was so different from the former East Germany. During this time, he also researched models for casinos and in the process saw an erotic performance that shocked him to his core. This was the unfettered lust and vice of a world without strict Soviet discipline. He also came to the conclusion that if such vices were to be allowed in Russia, the profits should go to the state. Sobjak tried to reshape St. Petersburg into this image, but along with the rest of Russia, crime came calling. Corruption with these casinos was high, and the government itself was not making the types of profits from the casinos as expected. But organized crime, and presumably many of the politicians themselves, were. Organized crime became such a huge problem that contracted murders and assassinations became common. This issue gripped all of Russia, with no clear way as to solve it given the power structure and the chaos. Reporters blamed Sobjak and his inner circle for the corruption. Some of the blame even landed on Putin. However, while Putin did get paid a little more than he was at the KGB, his property remained modest for his position. Like many things in this story, this could be an attempt to clean Putin's image in the wake of his later success, and rumors swirl that his public property didn't exactly match his actual total earnings when factoring in earnings under the table, something we'll get to in a bit when we discuss how Putin accumulated his wealth and how much he actually has. Whatever the case, Sobchak did not escape scrutiny the way Putin might have. Tell-all books were published by former allies and betrayals were common. Many former deputies and aides started running against Sobchak in elections while accusing him of countless improprieties. Sobchak did not help himself either. He was focused on improving the city in all the wrong ways. He brought Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton, Ted Turner, and other international figures for political and economic visits, some of which Putin oversaw in one of his many accumulated positions. Some of these visits led to misguided attempts at diverting business to the city, like Ted Turner's Goodwill Games. The games were a mismanaged disaster for St. Petersburg. However, any opposition to Sobchak from the council was met with undemocratic resistance from Sobchak, who would use his control of the city's TV channel to block rivals from having as much screen time as himself. 
In 1996, Putin's fellow deputy mayor Vladimir Yakolev ran against Sobchak as mayor. Sobchak had his back against the wall, and Putin was allegedly horrified at Yakolev's betrayal. In the end, Sobchak and Yakolev made it to a runoff election, which Sobchak lost. Upon his loss, an official investigation into Sobchak caused him to flee Russia. However, Putin's experience with Sobchak had made them friends, and Putin had developed a loyalty for those within Sobchak's circle and for the man himself. From this, he supposedly developed a bitter hatred for those who betrayed Sobchak. Putin's fierce loyalty and lack of forgiveness for betrayal are something the future president would come to be known for. Another trait Putin picked up in this time working for Sobchak is a distrust of the public and a growing hatred for the reach of journalism. He saw their attempts to hold officials accountable as something that got in the way of the government's work and its progress. Putin also embraced Sobchak's attempts at privatization of markets and companies that the Soviet Union once controlled. He was also party to some of Sobchak's mistakes in dealing with newly privatized assets, as was all of Russia during this time of transition. Whether this was deliberate corruption on his part or growing pains is debated. However, with some who have been exiled by Putin and little reason to lie about it at this point, claiming that while Putin was no saint, it was more of the latter growing pains, as we'll get into shortly when discussing how wealthy he is these days. Whatever the case, in all this, he learned the inner workings of the government, albeit on a municipal level. Even then, Sobchak gave him very high responsibilities, such as dealing with foreign dignities. This was a natural extent of his KGB training and time in East Germany, but it is something he would carry forth with him to the federal level. Putin gains a lot of knowledge under Sobchak. He learns not so much how to gain power, but what to do with it and the many ways that it can be lost. With Sobchak's career finished, Putin found himself jobless again. However, his work with Sobchak put him in the orbit of Boris Yeltsin's people. Boris Yeltsin's Russia was not going well. It suffered a lot of the same issues St. Petersburg suffered under Sobchak. The rapid transition to a capitalist economy opens the country to rampant corruption and crime, with many politicians seeming not too upset about this given the opportunity for their own advancement. Yeltsin also dealt with two major issues Sobchak did not. An unpopular war in Chechnya between 1994 and 1996, an ailing health which saw Yeltsin disappear from the public eye on occasion. He was, at this point, still the Federation's first president and was constantly worried about a safe transition of power. He also knew Russian history was not kind to former rulers or their families, so picking a successor with a thing for loyalty and who was able to keep him and his family safe were high on his list of qualifications. On this note, Yeltsin Yeltsin's Moscow had a thick atmosphere of mistrust by the time Putin fully entered that world. And this brings us to August of 1996, when a member of Yeltsin's cabinet called Putin to Moscow for an interview. The opportunity fell through, but instead of returning to St. Petersburg with nothing, Putin found himself working for Pavel Borodin of the Presidential Property Management Directorate. He worked as Borodin's deputy, and it was more or less his job to purchase the Soviet property that now lay outside of Russia's borders. From there, in March of 1997, Putin was placed in the position of main control directorate. He was given authority in investigating how government money was being spent and to end government corruption wherever he could find it. From this new position, he discovered just how corrupt and damaged the Federation was. He also became respected for doing his job well and returning government control to sectors that had gone rogue due to corruption. His outsider status, competence, and staying out of the Yeltsin inner circle drama allowed Putin another promotion. He was appointed to director of the FSB, the KGB's successor. This was an attempt by Yeltsin to control the more old-fashioned leaders of the FSB by appointing someone who understood them but was loyal to him. In this position, Putin guided the FSB through some modernizing reforms that reflect some of his later interests, such as monitoring the emergent internet. He also worked to corral the old guard, reshape the FSB to Yeltsin's demands, and even deal with a torrent of scandals dealing with the Kremlin, the FSB, and tensions in Chechnya. Because of all of this, Putin was once again rewarded for his diligence. On August the 5th of that year, Yeltsin would tell Putin, a man who just a short time before was relatively unknown to the wider public, of his plan to appoint him as prime minister. Being prime minister was more than a big deal. It was the ticket 
to the presidency. Yeltsin was worried about his own health, and on top of that, he had a habit of firing prime ministers. Putin, the aloof yet competent outsider, showed none of the signs of machinations or overt visible corruption of the previous prime ministers. Yeltsin wanted a stable picture for whom to leave the country to avoid the repeated fates of Russia's previous rulers. On this note, he also sought a successor who would guarantee the safety of his family upon leaving power. Putin's reputation for loyalty preceded itself on that one. He was the perfect candidate. Putin supposedly did not want to accept the position at first, but he eventually folded to Yeltsin. He was also put in charge of the Security Council in March of 1999, something he would hold on to even after he became president. During this time, the Second War in Chechnya started when rebels invaded the neighboring Republic of Dagestan. This war thrust Putin into a repeat of the mid-90s. The people feared an unpopular and bloody war. However, in his stint as prime minister, he proved to be more effective in leading the war than Yeltsin was before him. As a result of this and his other work, he became popular as prime minister. His successor firmly in place, at the end of the millennium, Boris Yeltsin resigned as president. This put Putin in the position of acting president. But he would have to run for election after six months, which he did, winning as his predecessor had hoped. From here, Putin held on to power with little difficulty. However, in 2008, after two terms as president, he faced a dilemma. The constitution only allowed two consecutive terms for any president. To overcome this obstacle, he had his prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, run for the presidency. Medvedev won and appointed Putin as prime minister. In reality, Putin held the real power and was subsequently re-elected in 2012 back to his old position. As for his presidency, Putin's outlook changed over the years with a pronounced conservative turn, starting with the ongoing tensions in Chechnya in 2004. Putin also became an ally of the Russian Orthodox Church as a byproduct of this turn. As with countless politicians, whether true or not in any given case is a matter of debate, but his asserted Christianity is often a talking point in his appeal to the people, emphasizing the importance of family and Christian values. Whatever the case there, Putin is often accused of scheming in his presidency to keep his inner circle in line and himself in power. On this note, it is speculated that he was in a rather good position for this, given his rise from the lowest ranks to the highest. Once he reached a state of power as president, he had a good understanding of how Russia worked from the municipal level all the way to the federal level. He also knew where the bodies were buried, literally and figuratively, for all the people all the way up the chain. Further contributing to his maintaining of power, he saw the way constitutions could be manipulated. Putin believed more in the latter of the law than the spirit of the law, and any constitution in Russia did not have the same semi-scriptural status that, say, the American constitution has. In the end, Putin's time with Sobchak showed him just how malleable constitutions are. On his own, Putin developed the idea that stability was more important than freedom, a position he has carried forth increasingly into older age. As previously alluded to, he has little love for journalists. His curtailing of the media is well known, and it largely stemmed from his time rising through the ranks. He saw media and journalism as an obstruction to the government's workings and making rapid progress. Either because enterprising individuals would use the media to their advantage, whether what they said was true or not, or journalists would poke their noses into sensitive business that may hinder something aesthetic sensibly overall good for the people. Even Putin's long connections to the oligarchs did not shield some of those who ran media companies that stepped on his toes, such as the case of the oligarch who owned NTV, which after being critical of Putin, was given to a more Putin-friendly oligarch in 2001. Controlling the media with an iron fist is one way to stay in power, but it's not the only way. As such, Putin maintained countless connections that he made in his career. Like elsewhere, these connections remained important in Russian politics, but they were leaned on more heavily as social currency. He understood this and developed and maintained numerous such associations, even as he reached the top, continuing to keep a large core of allies loyal to him among those below him. Part of this social currency is loyalty and punishment of betrayal, which Putin took extremely seriously. Loyalty was rewarded, such as helping out Sobchak during his legal troubles heading into 2000. The system of connections is how he keeps the oligarchs in line. As long as they don't get involved in politics against him and do support him, they're more or less free to operate how they want. So what about the infamous assassination attempts that 
the regime is known for. Shootings and poisonings were never something Putin was known for during his time with the KGB. He denied ever committing crimes for the agency during his political rise. If anything, he had experience investigating hits and assassinations during his time with the FSB, rather than him being the one to order them. That said, it's probable he trained in assassinations at the Red Banner Institute, and it is noted that the assassinations of people like Boris Nebsov, Boris Berezovsky, and the attempted assassination of Alexei Navalny helped protect Putin's regime. Of course, whether he was directly involved or simply the people who have an interest in keeping Putin in power just take care of it for him without consulting him is a matter of debate. Moving on from there, Putin also values the aesthetic of the old Soviet Union over its ideology. He appeals to a nostalgia of Russia's central place in the Soviet Empire, but he is no communist. One of Putin's famous quotes is, anyone who doesn't mourn the passing of the Soviet Union has no heart. Anyone who wants it restored has no brains. On a domestic level, Putin offers a form of continuity between Soviet and federal Russia that appeals to many hardliners left over from the Soviet days, while also calling those who enjoy the freedoms gained during the Federation. This is especially true for the Orthodox Christians. He also appeals to nostalgia for the Russian empires of Peter and Catherine the Great. This plays into the fears of republics like Chechnya breaking away. Such breakaways are feared to trigger a domino effect of independence movements that would weaken Russia and the pride of the Russian people. The pre-Soviet legacy hangs heavily on Putin. After all, he took part in changing Leningrad back to St. Petersburg. He often struggles to keep lands that was gained during Imperial Russia, such as the Caucasus Republics. On an international level, his Soviet nostalgia is less assuring for former Eastern Bloc and Soviet Republics. The presence of Russians in many of these countries and the claims of former Soviet lands have opened these countries to invasions and excursions, of which there were the wars in Georgia and Ukraine. Putin uses the specter of the Soviet Union and Russia's past as an empire to fuel the drive forward for a modern Russian identity. Now, you might note in all of this that we haven't really explicitly mentioned Putin accumulating wealth as a means for himself to stay in power or protect himself. Now, this might seem strange given that Putin is rumored to be one of, if not the wealthiest person alive today. But is Putin actually anywhere near as wealthy as the rumors say? Beyond, as mentioned, the seeming rather shady 1990s St. Petersburg $93 million food supply scandal, which again, at least as far as anyone can tell, did not make Putin himself a single dollar richer. What about after? And what about now? Once elected, Putin, like his predecessor, began reporting his finances and holdings publicly, including his salary and exact amount in his many bank accounts. He has continued to do so since. The result? Well, over the years, while his salary has changed regularly from year to year, he has made approximately 100 to 190,000 American dollars annually in that span. For example, in 2018, reporting an income of 135,000 American dollars. Today, between his wife's and his own accounts, the couple seem to have a little over half a million dollars in cash in various bank accounts, though why he isn't investing this is rather curious, given his apparent lack of any other investments and almost complete lack of actually needing any cash for his day-to-day -day life, given the government foots the bill for most of everything. Of this, Putin states, Honestly speaking, I don't even know what my salary is. They deliver it to me, I take it, put it in my bank account, and don't even count it. As for his other assets, he also owns a studio-sized apartment in St. Petersburg, a slightly larger apartment in Moscow, owns a small garage, a couple of cars, a small plot of land outside of Moscow, and otherwise has various minor assets of no great worth. Of course, over the years, people can't help but notice that Putin has a collection of watches that he wears very publicly, whose purchase price combined is around that of his reported entire net worth, ringing in at about $400,000 to $700,000 if various reports to be believed. For reference, the highest valued watch he has been spotted wearing costs around $140,000. It's a Patek Philippe perpetual calendar watch. Good choice. On top of that, the clothing he can often be seen wearing is likewise extremely expensive, such as his $6,000 plus tailored suits from outlets like Kiton and Brioni. Not only expensive suits, in one photo of him working out, Putin can be seen wearing sweatpants that cost over $1,400 a pair, apparently being made from silk cashmere and the tears of impoverished children, along with a 
similarly priced top. On top of that, among other mansions, he is long rumored to own an estate known as Putin's Palace near Praskovica, widely reported to be worth $1 billion by media outlets. However, this was actually sold in 2011 to one Alexander Ponomarenko, a former associate of Putin's, for somewhere around $350 million. Though the exact amount has not been publicly disclosed, but Pomarenko has indicated that it's in the ballpark of that widely reported figure. Pomarenko purchased the estate from a group led by businessman Nikolai Shamilov. Ponomarenko claims that he decided to buy the company behind the estate project and thus the mansion as it was a steal of a deal owing to the project being stalled from lack of funds to complete the estate and the business group wanting to cut their losses on it rather than complete it. That said, businessman Sergei Koloznikov, who is exiled from Russia, claims that the palace was built specifically for Putin's use. He claims Putin was able to afford its construction in part thanks to a gift given to him by the aforementioned Nikolai Shamilov in the form of 94% of the shares in a company called Lyris Holdings. Among other personal knowledge of the development of the palace, Kolesnikov claims Shamilov himself told him this, and to quote him, I have no reason not to believe him. However, no documents concerning any ownership connected to the project seem to indicate Putin or any holdings of Putin's ever were directly involved with this estate. That said, some contract documents concerning its construction allegedly have the signature of one Vladimir Kozhin, one of Putin's inner circle of confidants. Of course, this still doesn't definitively indicate whether Putin actually owns the palace or even was behind its building at all. Simply, allegedly, someone he is close with was involved in some capacity and later someone else he is close to bought it a bit of a theme for a lot of these rumors. Though this perhaps shouldn't come as a huge surprise, even if nothing shady is going on, given Putin's widespread connections to most of the powerful and extremely wealthy elite in Russia that comes naturally by his very position in the government. On this specific one, Putin himself denies he had anything to do with the palace being built. Nevertheless, Putin allegedly frequently visits the palace, and Federal Protective Service guards have been seen at the mansion, along with locals reportedly seeing Putin in the area regularly. Of course, among the extremely wealthy with such mansions, it is not uncommon at all to let friends and guests into one's estate whenever they please, so Putin would not actually have to own the thing to stay there, nor would it be a big ask to do so, more or less par for the course among the exorbitantly wealthy with giant mansions. That said, on top of this estate, Putin has been connected to causing or having secretly had built several other mansions, as well as yachts, planes, etc. Whether he actually owns any of these, or like Putin's palace, seemingly is just using them whenever he pleases, his flashing of extreme wealth in the case of his watches and other items, along with an awful lot of not implausible allegations of widespread corruption within his government connected to him, has led to belief that he has boatloads of money secretly stashed away in accounts throughout the world. Others speculate Putin is simply using the government coffers to finance all of these extravagances. For many items, this would not actually be that uncommon for a major world leader, if more excessive than most. For example, the replacement Air Force One planes the US president will have at his disposal have a budget of over $3 billion. The US president also gets a pretty posh mansion, the White House, and vacation spots to go to at their leisure, with the taxpayer footing the bill for quite a lot of such perks, with few batting an eyelid at these extravagances. But of course, the US government isn't funding $140,000 of watches for the president, though bulletproof tailored suits occasionally worn by the president are presumably paid for by the US taxpayer. For more on this incredibly thin bulletproof fabric, go see our video, How Many Times Can You Shoot Through a Bulletproof Vest Before It Stops Working? To attempt to clarify these items, requests have been made to the Russian government asking if, for example, Putin's watches are actually his property or property of the state that he is simply wearing, but no answer to this question has been given that we could find. Whatever the case, and going back to the issue of how he has stayed in power so long, yet others claim Putin is simply enriching many people around him, and it is they who are happy to provide Putin with anything and everything his judo master heart can desire. Yet others claim it's all three. Putin is enriching himself through shady means and using government funds and people he is helping make wealthy to get whatever he wants while he's in office. But what does the man himself say about all these rumors of him accumulating insane amounts of wealth? To quote him, I am the wealthiest man, not just in Europe, but in the whole world. Case closed, right? He admitted it. Well, in truth, he wasn't finished talking. He goes on, I collect emotions. I am wealthy in that the people of Russia have twice entrusted me with the leadership of a great nation such as Russia. I believe that is my greatest wealth. 
Of course, whether he collects emotions or not, it doesn't inherently negate the first part of that statement, simply that he considers that a greater wealth than whatever he has possession-wise. Argue amongst yourself whether this was Putin cleverly admitting to being the wealthiest person in the world while making it seem like he was saying he wasn't, and also simultaneously admitting he's a lizard person, given a hallmark of these creatures is apparently feeding on human emotions. For a more direct answer to the question about the rumors of his extreme wealth, he clarifies, it's just chit chat, nonsense, nothing to discuss. They picked it out of their noses and smeared it on their pieces of paper. The Press and Information Office of the President of the Russian Federation also asserts of these rumors, this information has no substance. As you may know, the declarations of Mr. Putin's income and property are published annually. We recommend you to use only reliable sources henceforward and not to believe fake news. Naturally, nobody seems satisfied with these assertions, given his apparent and frequent flashing of wealth far beyond what anyone with his salary should be able to afford. So what do others who might know a little bit more say? First, we have political analyst and noted critic of Putin, Stanislav Belkovsky, who claimed to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in 2012 that Putin had a net worth of approximately $70 billion, though how he came up with that figure isn't exactly definitive, nor does it inspire a lot of confidence. In his own words, the figure of $40 billion emerged in 2007. That figure could now have changed, I believe, at the level of $60 to $70 billion. Maximum, we cannot know. I suspect there are some businesses I know nothing about. Out. Mildly more concrete, at least in terms of giving something more specific, he also claims much of this wealth is because of Putin's alleged 4.5% stake in Gazprom, 37% stake in Surgut Neftgas, and, and an allegedly 50% ownership stake of Gunvor. How he knows this, however, isn't fully clear. Belkovsky simply states he got this information through sources he has within the companies. It's also noted that for a time, Gunvor was co owned by a friend of Putin's billionaire, Gennady Timchenko. But what do the three companies say? For whatever it's worth, corporate affairs director of the Swiss-based Gunvor Group, Seth Thomas Pietras, states, President Putin has never had any interest in, investment in, or involvement with Gunvor Group either directly or indirectly. Mr. Belkovsky's claims are based on absolutely nothing and are fundamentally ridiculous. Then the US government, despite its statement, has never sanctioned Gunvor in any capacity, nor has it provided any evidence of its own. Moving on to Surgut Neftegas, they likewise deny Putin owns any shares. Gazprom, which is majority owned by the Russian government itself, with the rest of the stock publicly traded, likewise shows no records of Putin owning any shares. Belkovsky counters these denials by the companies and lack of records, stating Putin has a rather elaborate network of offshore companies and funds that own the shares, which all ultimately mask that he himself actually owns, or at least controls them. Now let's move on to the CEO of Hermitage Capital Management, Bill Browder. He is the one that seems to have started the widespread rumor that Putin's personal wealth is in excess of $200 billion, stating before a Senate Judiciary Committee, I believe he is worth $200 billion. The purpose of the Putin regime has been to commit terrible crimes in order to get that money. He keeps his money in the West, and all of his money in the West is potentially exposed to asset freezes and confiscation. Therefore, he has a significant and very personal interest in finding a way to get rid of the Magnitsky sanctions. On this latter note, one of Browder's former associates, Russian lawyer Sergei Magnitsky, was investigating corruption within the Russian government and allegedly found evidence of various Russian officials taking part in a near quarter of a billion dollar tax fraud scheme. Magnitsky himself was then arrested for allegedly being the mastermind behind the tax fraud and died while in jail before his trial because of course he did. At the partial encouragement of Browder, the US then passed the Magnitsky Act in 2009. In an oversimplified nutshell, this allows the US government to sanction various individuals thought to be human rights offenders, ban them from entering the US, and more importantly, freeze their assets where the government is able. The bill was essentially meant to allow the government to legally hold somewhat accountable those thought to have been involved in Magnitsky's death. As for hard data, however, Browder offers little. Next up, noted economist Anders Asland, author of the book Russia's Crony Capitalism, The Path from Market Economy to Kleptocracy, states, 
I would estimate that Putin is worth around 100 to 160 billion dollars. We can see that Putin and his friends have taken 10 to 15 billion dollars from Gazprom every year since 2014. And that's just Gazprom. There are large numbers of transactions being made. What's much more difficult is to see where the money goes. It's typically Cyprus, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, and Wilmington, Delaware. As to how he came up with these figures, he states, My assessment is that since Putin's circle got its looting fully organized, around 2006, they have extracted 15 to 25 billion dollars a year, reaching a total of 195 to 325 billion dollars, a large share of the Russian private offshore wealth. Presuming that half of this wealth belongs to Putin, his net worth should amount to 100 to 160 billion dollars. Naturally, Putin and his cronies cannot enjoy their wealth. It's all about power. If they are not the wealthiest, they fear they will lose power. Why he assumes Putin would get half of these alleged amounts instead of some other percentage is not fully clear. On that note, like so many before, nobody seems to be able to actually offer hard evidence that Putin has any money stashed away anywhere not publicly known, which, when taking sums of allegedly $200 billion, is a pretty neat trick for someone who has been so highly scrutinized, including by the US Senate, who presumably, if they wanted, could just ask the CIA or other entities good at collecting such data to look into it. Given instead they are asking the likes of Browder, it has been presumed and widely claimed that the CIA and other such government entities have no definitive intelligence on this either. From this lack of a paper trail directly linking money or assets to Putin, yet his clearly lavish lifestyle, indicating he does indeed have access to an awful lot of money, this has led many to conclude that Putin himself doesn't actually officially own most or all of the wealth attributed to him, but rather he is leveraging his position and connections to enrich those close to him who, in their gratitude, are more than happy to provide Putin with any money or items he wants, from access to mansions to yachts to sweatpants that keep his judo jubblies extra comfortable are working out. And, of course, all of this keeps them having a vested interest in Putin staying in power, so it works out for everyone, if true. As alleged evidence for this, we turn to the 11.5 million documents from the Panama Mossack Fonseca law firm made public in 2016, dealing in offshore holdings by over 200,000 entities. While Putin himself is not listed in any of them, the documents do reveal three close associates of Putin's among those having offshore holdings partially managed by the law firm with a combined amount of around $2 billion between the trio. Despite not owning these assets, there are many claims by various individuals that Putin uses some of these like his personal bank account, most notably the holdings of a man claimed by many in the media to be Putin's best friend, famed Russian musician and conductor Sergei Roldugin. Not just a friend, Roldugin is also the godfather to one of Putin's children and was the man who introduced Putin to Putin's wife. As for where Roldugin supposedly got his extreme wealth, beyond his noted music career starting in the 1990s, Roldugin began investing in various oil and other business entities to great success. Beyond all of this, in 2009, Roldugin was also accused of being involved in a massive multi-billion dollar money laundering scheme in conjunction with Spurbank CIB, which allegedly profited for him greatly. That said, for those using these records as proof of Putin having money elsewhere via his associates, it should be again noted that these are the records of well over 200,000 entities throughout the world. And the vast majority who are using the firm are doing so completely legitimately, including actor Jackie Chan, who reportedly had six perfectly above-board offshore companies the law firm helped manage various facets of. The fact that three among Putin's numerous friends who are exorbitantly wealthy should be included isn't necessarily proof of anything other than that they wanted to have some assets outside of Russia, which isn't uncommon among the wealthy in Russia. As some formerly close to Putin, who have had their assets stripped away and been forced to flee the country, demonstrate, having some offshore holdings is probably a good security blanket of sorts, you know, just in case. On this note, political scientist, professor, and author of Putin's kleptocracy, Karen Dawisha, stated before her death from lung cancer in 2018, Why is it that $150 billion left the country last year? Because they believe that their wealth can only be secured in the long term outside their own country. 
Coming back to the question of Putin's wealth, whether these funds are being held for him or not, this is still not Putin's money, not just technically, but oh, we're guessing regardless of the amount of goodwill Putin has built up with these various businessmen and women, should he no longer be in power, they might quickly find themselves less than willing to continue to support his lifestyle, if that is what has been happening, as people believe. And some speculate that he might even find himself in a rather unsafe circumstance in that case, giving him even more of a vested interest in staying in power. For example, one-time billionaire and the man formerly known as Putin's banker, but now exiled from Russia, Sergei Pugachev, says everything that belongs to the territory of the Russian Federation, Putin considers to be his. Everything. Gazprom, Rosneft, private companies. Any attempt to calculate it won't succeed. He's the richest person in the world until he leaves power. As for leaving power, he goes on that Putin chose not to leave office after his first term and beyond, not because of a desire for continued power, but rather because he feared for his own safety should he no longer be in that position. Even today, Pugachev claims, I don't see any guarantees for him if he steps down. Putin doesn't see them either. Which is why he finds it unlikely that Putin will ever willingly leave office. Also, for whatever it's worth, Pugachev, despite having billions stripped from himself by the Russian government, being currently in fear of his life and in exile, states in his opinion, Putin himself is not evil, nor did Putin originally plan to set up a corrupt government when he took power, simply that he surrounded himself with like-minded people whom he didn't know very well and who had served with him in the KGB. They immediately began enriching themselves. Putin wanted to get rich too. He was a pragmatic person. We talked about this. He didn't want to leave office poor. As for the Russian government's position with regards to Pugachev, it is claimed that Pugachev defrauded the government of hundreds of millions of dollars, which is why the one-time bosom buddy of Putin originally had to go on the run. Pugachev counters, the state steals something, then has to defend its theft. In my case, the scale is huge, but in other respects, this is normal contemporary practice in Russia. This is all left to the one-time billionaire with, by his accounts, only about $70 million to his name, which he's kept in offshore holdings. It, it's got to be rough. In truth, this amount is unfortunate for him because Pugachev allegedly was offered a deal from a Russian official that if he paid $300 million to certain entities, his legal troubles in Russia would be made to be resolved to his benefit and he could return to Russia. Further, siding in the camp that Putin doesn't have hundreds of billions stashed away he officially owns, the aforementioned Karen DeWisher, who perhaps gives some of the best accounts and most concrete details of the alleged corruption within the Russian government in her book Putin's Kleptocracy, states that Putin's real worth comes from his position. Position. He takes what he wants. When you are the president of Russia, you don't need a written contract. You are the law. Again, backing up this position, financial investigator Elberg Fahl states, Putin controls wealth through proxies. He then makes up examples to illustrate. Sergei owes his fortune to Putin, so when Putin asks Sergei a favor, the favor must be honored. A luxury cruise, use of a private Dakar, expensive consumer goods, etc. Ivan owns a shipping company and owes his wealth to Putin, so when Putin requests a favor, Ivan, like Sergei, honors the request. So again, is Putin actually enriching himself in all of this. While, as Gaddafi demonstrated, it is possible to squirrel away $200 billion secretly, given the level of scrutiny thrown Putin's way by governments the world over looking into the matter, with nobody seemingly able to come up with any kind of hard evidence, most think he probably doesn't have anywhere close to such an absorbent amount that is actually his, though it is generally accepted that he probably does have at least some significant amount stashed away somewhere. For most, however, the explanation for his rather luxurious lifestyle is more reasonably explained by the simple fact that he can pretty much have the Russian government foot the bill for anything he wants without much uproar or oversight. And it does seem like an awful lot of his compatriots have gotten exceedingly wealthy during his tenure, at least part in thanks to their connections with Putin and him leveraging his position to help facilitate their enrichment. Thus, if that is what has happened, it's reasonable enough that many of those people are happy to scratch his back whenever he feels the need for a new yacht or something, without Putin actually needing to have his name on anything to avoid the backlash that would result should he be discovered to have such things. This further also all ensures that many wealthy and powerful people have a vested interest in keeping Putin in power so long as the spice continues to flow, so to speak. Thus, going back to the question of using his wealth to stay in power, it's alleged that he doesn't exactly use any of his own money to make this happen, but it is speculated he does use money via his influence on a pretty broad scale to help ensure that he does stay in power as previously described. Make everyone loyal to him rich, and they will ensure 
that he's going to stay in power. Of course, as to the idea that he really does have $200 billion simply being held in other people's names as alluded to, we're guessing even if many of these individuals are actually holding money for Putin, that should he ever step down from power and ask for that money to be given to him en masse, or even to remain in power and ask for a combined sum of $200 billion, that shortly thereafter memorials and monuments would be being built for the former Russian leader who sadly died in his sleep of natural causes. But but now, the man himself remains in power via a variety of means that really aren't that different from many a leader the world over today and throughout history. In the end, Putin is a complicated man who rose from almost nothing to heights of power few in history have achieved. Like him or hate him, he has been and continues to be one of the most important shapers of the 21st century, and his presence can be felt more now than ever with little end in sight. Although, unless he is really one of the lizard people, he's probably not immortal, so at some point in the next couple of decades, he'll probably shuffle off this mortal coil, and perhaps then, like Gaddafi, more definitive data will be revealed about his wealth and his conduct while in office. Or perhaps sooner, if he eventually loses the protection of his position and the vultures swoop in to pick clean his political corpse.